So my name is Srikant. I work for the FreeBSC team in Juniper. Um, I guess uh, after reviewing all the presentations today, one thing that I noticed was I didn't have my bio slide on that. It's going to be my first presentation. Maybe next time I'll put a more elaborate one about the, the team in uh, Juniper for FreeBSD. So I'll be giving a very brief overview of the rescue kernel and direct dumper in FreeBSD. Uh, I guess it's not overly technical, but yeah, it's going to, uh, the objective was to engage the community on uh, this topic. So this work was primarily done by Clara, Clara Systems for Juniper Networks. And uh, I guess the heavy lifting was done by Clara. And then there was some porting effort to make it work within the, the Junos build environment and uh, deploy it for the Juniper uh, boxes. So I'll, I'll give a overview and the what and why, why this solution was required for us. Uh, so some of the boxes that we have, we have no problem with provisioning, uh, you know, any amount of storage partitions or so on. So when you typically want to save a crash dump, you have a, a FreeBSD swap partition created. And uh, at the point of crash, uh, you just capture the state of the system memory and uh, it is redirected or, or captured onto the dump tab, which is mapped to the swap. Uh, and after reboot, the save core script should save the, the, the crash dump and save it to the war, war crash. Um, but that requires a dedicated swap partition. And that is what is a little uh, challenging when you go to low-end boxes. So for our low-end boxes, we have some gear, some EX gear that uh, looks like this when you do the gpart show. Uh, you have a 8 gig storage, and uh, 1.5 gigs is given to the OM volume, which is an administration volume. It has a very small recovery snapshot and some essential files to uh, recover the Junos volume in case that goes bad. And the rest of it is given to the Junos um, uh, partition. Now, there is no scope here to add or create a, a separate swap partition here. So in case of panic, we still need to be able to collect the crash dump, and preferably on, on the Junos volume. Um, that is why we need an alternative solution. And even for some of our virtualized uh, platforms, uh, we have similar challenges where uh, most of the provisioning is done with respect to the OM volume and uh, the Junos volume, and uh, a very small negligible thing is given for the swap. So again, capturing crash dumps on uh, such a box becomes a challenge. So this is the, the why we needed that. So that's where the rescue kernel and direct dumper came into the picture. Um, the key requirements or uh, key points for the rescue kernel and direct dumper are uh, when the main kernel panics, you want to automatically boot a small but dedicated rescue kernel, which has very minimum uh, things to do, that it runs out of the reserved region and RAM, and it should be able to uh, quickly repair and mount the local file system. Uh, then once it, it, it makes sure that the file system is OK, uh, it proceeds to uh, capture the contents of the RAM for, from the main kernel uh, directly to a file. Uh, it does not require any reservation of the disk space. Now, the downside for that with, with the current implementation is the integration complexity. Uh, the changes are such that you want to be able to compile, are, are you're you are compiling the uh, rescue kernel and uh, the small uh, root file system directly with the main kernel. Uh, and that, that is the integration complexity uh, with the current approach. Uh, it allows you to embed a small root file system, uh, so which means that uh, it allows you with a minimal script uh, and uh, uh, you know some interactive uh, capabilities. So a typical script could look like this, where you could do a quick file system check, uh, mount the volume. In our case, it is the Junos volume, and 
do a DD just to capture the crash dump and then proceed to reboot the box. Uh, these are some of the build aspects of it. Um, we want to keep the kernel small, so that's why we exclude a lot of the key options like SMP, witness, uh, syscall description, and so on. So that is where why it is like so lightweight uh, and very minimal in its objectives. Um, embedding logic in the kernel postmark is where the embedding uh, magic happens. Uh, you pass the rescue kernel image and the small root file system, the embedfs, and use the MFS image option uh, to build a rescue.o binary, which is then linked into the main kernel. Now, where this would show up is when you run the op stump on your main kernel, you would see a new section that got added, which is the MFS, and that would be, uh, pro uh, what do you say, uh, proportional to the size of your rescue kernel in the embed FS. So next, I'm going to talk about like what are the, the main tasks for the rescue kernel uh, versus the, sorry, the, the main kernel versus the rescue kernel. So the main kernel, when it boots, it has to initialize a staging area for the rescue kernel. It is done via a sys in it, and uh, it would do the essential uh, metadata stashing, uh, loader tunables, and the FI memory map. Uh, then it proceeds to copy the rescue kernel to the staging area. Any tunables that you would like to pass to the, the rescue kernel would be prefixed with the debug.rescue. Um, that's till the point where the main kernel processes them and then uh, sets it up for the rescue kernel where the rescue prefix will be dropped. And then finally register the rescue dumper via the dumper insert. So this time around when you check what is your dump dev, dump dev it will show up as rescue rather than the standard uh, default one. CPU mini dumpsys is the path where the fork would happen. So it would check uh, if you have the do rescue mini dump global uh, configured or like set, and that's where it will take the path to boot the rescue kernel. There's trampoline logic. Uh, both for ARM64 and AMD64 to jump to the rescue kernel. I think the approaches used by both are dependent on the architecture. So it's a, it's a little different for AMD64 versus the ARM64. The rescue kernel booting is pretty standard. It, it doesn't have anything fancy. It, it boots like a normal uh, kernel boot. Uh, it, it detects uh, probes and attaches like the storage devices maybe. And uh, it has a dev dumper, access to a dev dumper, which is, which is where uh, the support for, or for capturing the host kernel's RAM will come from. The dev dumper driver will provide the dopen and dread calls, uh, support for the dread calls. So dopen will, uh, what do you say, map the segments that are needed for, uh, for the, from the host kernel that need, to be get, that need to get included in the mini dump. And when you DD from the dev dumper to the, the Junos volume or like whichever partition you are, uh, you are trying to copy, it would invoke the D read from underneath. So this is the, these are the differences between the, the main kernel versus the rescue kernel. And uh, I think the next two slides, I'm just highlighting the uh, difference in the code paths. So if, if you look at this, like the <coughs> initial set of calls are, are the same, but when you arrive at like CPU mini dumpsters, that's when you decide uh, whether you want to do a rescue mini dump or um, the standard approach. Yes, with that, I just wanted to show a quick demo. This is not from a stock FreeBSD for us. It is uh, from our EX box. Uh, I have a DDB built into my uh, kernel, so I can drop to the debugger with with a key sequence and simulate a panic. So we see here uh, it has the sprint where the main kernel will hand off to the rescue kernel and then you see immediately the rescue kernel booting. So this would be very quick. Uh, it doesn't 
as I said, it doesn't do a lot of uh, other probe and attach. Um, its job would be to do the quick file system check and assess how much of dump it needs to capture. So once that is done, it would directly write to the wire crash on the host uh, or the, the partition where which was mounted for the original kernel and proceed to reboot. I guess that's the overview of the, the rescue kernel and the direct dumper. Now, in terms of upstreaming and what are the further roadmap, uh, this review has been submitted by Justin Hibbets. He's part of my team. Um, there are a lot of interesting discussions on that review already as of writing or as of presenting this today. So some of the improvements are like, you know, we changed the approach from embedding the rescue kernel at build time to preferentially loading the rescue kernel into a reserved memory via some kind of a syscall interface. Um, and possible additional use cases are if someone would like to uh, do dump to a encrypted storage, then this could provide like a framework to extend. To extend, uh, you know, you could extend that framework to that uh, use case. Um, also, maybe evaluate this to you know boot an alternate kernel. I guess that's that's that, and this is just to show uh, what's the bloat in the kernel when I compile it with and without the rescue. So my production kernel was 7.9 megs and with my rescue kernel plus the embedded FS, it bloated by around like 16 megs, which is what shows up in the MFS section part of the main kernel. Yes, yep, uh, open to questions. And my dulcet voice, I don't, I don't think either of those are true. Um, so uh, one of the problems I ran into with ARM is that the interrupt processor has a misdesign. Once you program it once, you can't reprogram it without doing a hard reset. And you can't do a hard reset and do uh, transfer um, to a new kernel in a controlled way. So the old Linux kernel passes to the new Linux kernel or to the new FreeBSD kernel with my stuff the state of the interrupt controller. Um, is that something that uh, you guys are doing now, or are you running on hardware where that's needed, or what's, how, do you, how do you handle that? We haven't definitely evaluated that. This was for uh, a crash dump. I think we didn't really care about the piece that you're talking about, so that's why it's not on our roadmap, I guess, but yeah. You're using interrupts, because I know one of the things in the patch is um, it iterates all the interrupt sources to shut them down um, before booting into the, like that's one of the FDEFs in current interrupt C, I think, is to shut all the I sources down before we boot the new kernel. So I think you just haven't tripped over that particular interrupt controller on ARM yet, is my guess. Although if you shut them all down, maybe it, well, it's the one, you have that one block of memory where the thing is mapped and that's what you can't move. There's a, re like a register that points to like a, a table in memory, I think for the ARM GIC, and you can't, you can write once, you don't get to change it. Anyway, if you haven't hit it yet, you will probably hit it. Um, one thing I, I, you had asked about was other use cases and some of the ones that we've thought about are obviously a more performant version of NetDump, rather than having to do polled IO on the NIC and so on. If you're booting this rescue kernel, you can bring up the full network stack and be able to send a crash dump to a remote machine much faster than 
you could in the, the existing net dump stuff and possibly with a lot less setup uh, and so on. Uh, but another use case that I've personally been interested in is being able to do a crash dump directly to a ZFS file system. Right? Because once you're booted in this rescue kernel, you can have a working kernel that can import a ZFS pool. And like in your case where you're writing to UFS, you could again be able to take the crash dump to ZFS without, uh, you know, especially on large memory systems where we've seen systems with as much as six terabytes of RAM in them now, uh, you know, you're not going to have that much swap laying around to be able to take a crash dump of, you know, a huge amount of memory. And so being able to put that directly on a file system, again, is much nicer than the doesn't actually work yet version of crash dump to RAID Z that uh, ZFS has some support for where you kind of pre-allocate all the space ahead of time so that you could just have your rescue kernel or your regular crash dump try to write to those offsets or something. Whereas, you know, having a fully working file system uh, gives you a lot more options. Or a fully working kernel means you have a lot more options for, like you said, encryption, uh, compression, and then sending it to other places or file systems or the network or whatever. I guess uh, the review page is also interesting. I mean, several good comments already, I guess. So it's worth the read. I guess that's it. Thank you.